Welcome to the Lesbo and the Bean universe. Lesbo and the Bean. L-A-T-B. Lat B. Where mixed martial arts and the UFC get silly. Big silly. Buckle up and move your tray tables to their upright position. And please, somebody shut that baby up. It's time for Lesbo and the Bean. Welcome back. Welcome back. Episode 190. We get in there. We got another weekend of fights coming up. Out of where is this actual location? I want to say Kansas City. I want to say Nashville. Nashville. It is Nashville. I want to say Nebraska even. But we I wore this shirt. Ooh. I was gonna wear a cowboy hat, but I don't have one. And I was gonna wear boots, but I don't have one. And is that officially because Cowboy is officially fighting Al Ayakinta? That is officially late breaking. Is that why? Um, no, because Nashville. Oh, in general. I thought you were gonna wear your Elvis suit. Isn't Nashville where Graceland is? <laughs> I'm sorry, fans in Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee, right? Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee. Who's out of there? Is it OSP and or I want to say Ortiz? Dustin Ortiz might be out of Nashville. I feel like Nashville I've heard well. good things about Nashville and Knoxville. The music industry is all sorts Isn't of good Dollywood stuff. Dollywood right? in Tennessee? Dollywood's in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I love me some Dolly. Joe Lee, look it up. It's a good one. Jolene. Jolie or Jolene? Jolene. 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 I'm begging of you, please don't, don't take my, my man. <laughs> You're welcome there. Little Dollywood into everybody's life. And Harmony. <laughs> so. Uh, other late breaking news that's been going around the Twitter versus uh, all I gotta say is I'm not surprised. I am not surprised. Been talking about it a long time here. TJ Dillashaw did show Alpha Male how to do all the juice. Cody Garban was talking about it, and officially USADA has been talking about it. TJ getting ahead of the curb and actually relinquishing his belt prior to his official notice by the UFC that he popped on his. Henry Cejudo, if not other tests. What have you heard about this? What do you think's going on? I mean, who didn't really see this coming? I'm kind of surprised, especially little TJ. I don't, not at all. Not even a bit. And he has all these doctors and he's, you're not, you think everybody's doing it though. If, but more so, T, TJ's body's grown more than most. And I feel like he's so little. He's his in this little stage. Sorry, I but you don't have to become a mo- you don't have to become a um, bodybuilder. Like there's different types of steroids that'll thin out your blood. That'll give you extra cardio. As Jail Zonin, he never looked like a muscle up guy, and he was on everything. But it was all EPO based substances, or like cardio. So that allows oh, you to do work. That's different. It it's still a steroid and an illicit substance. But for me, TJ's really had those. Chromatin brows for a while. A lot of people say it's uh, scar tissue, but Cody was talking about it. I just, for me, it makes me question every single camp TJ touches. If Alpha Male, if he taught all of Alpha Male how to do steroids, Elevation, Train Rain, and what are the other organizations like? You gotta, I you gotta look into it. No, I don't know because you just go on Cody and I'm like, Cody, um, he didn't teach you how to do the steroids very well. (laughs) (laughs) Does it help (laughs) TBI? I know he didn't teach any alpha male how to do it very well. He's on a losing streak and so is all alpha male. Chad Mendes got on steroids. He took two years off for it. Your right, Faber wasn't around for you, Sada. Just throwing that out there. All those people aren't, um, all those people are uh, on losing streaks. Yeah, you, there's a point there. There is a point, but I'm just saying look into it. Because everybody is on steroids. Everybody is on steroids. Do you think the Diaz brothers are? They have enough weed in their system that it turns into steroids. <laughs> weed equals steroids if you have enough of it. That is a total bro science. No, actually, some of the few that might not be doing it is the Diaz brothers. But, again, look at their body type. They look much more like triathletes other than... Do Fighters. you think this has anything to do with, remember when John Jones says there's somebody else? There's somebody else, everyone, that is going to go through this and you guys uh, will find out about it and it's up to the... Uh, he was talking about Paulo Costa, right? 
I don't know. <laughs> I can't even imagine they're friends. Or but Joe TJ. Romero? Or who else do we randomly look at? Jake Matthews? People that haven't officially popped that I'm like, oh, uh, duh. Okay, one thing I do have to say, and I'm totally... I'm bummed out because TJ was one of my faves. I have a weird list of favorites, but TJ was in my top 10. And it bums me out because I was liking his science route. He was taking this and just... He really turned me, like, I turned heel. I used to be an alpha male, and now I'm totally team TJ. And this really bums me out because I thought he was just going to do it with smarts and science and just... Just like Ivan Drago? <laughs> Against Rocky? Didn't he do the science and the steroids? Yeah, and... <laughs> I know. I guess that's true. I guess that's totally true. For some reason, at first, I thought of Cal Drago, and I was like... The mother of dragons? That sexy bitch? Aquaman? Oh, right around the corner. <laughs> Drago, it's so Definitely close. GFT right <laughs> on the tip of the tongue for all the good right reasons we're about to get into that fun season. Can't wait for it. But oh, other- it really just bums me out and I I it will bum me out to miss part of TJ's career, but here's something that you have to say even if you're the biggest TJ hater in the world for all the bullshit that we've dealt with with all the UFC and belt bullshit. Thank you, sir, for coming out and in the same statement as saying, hey, I popped. I'm going to have to figure it out. This and this and this happened. I'm laying my belt down. I fucking respect the shit out of that. Thank you for not holding up the division. Thanks for not giving an excuse to Dana of some hullabaloo. And just, I think it's Cejudo versus uh, Marais. And that's the fight for the interim, in my opinion. And I just really, you got to... So I can't wait to see TJ back. I'm glad that happened. I think TJ's actually being next level with his actual product and brand, just like T-City and everyone's already just been like, whatever, he already confessed to it. By him getting away from it, getting ahead of it, what sounds better? I relinquish the belt or I got stripped. I relinquish it all um, day. million That's percent, smart. right? But I like that he does that because you know how many times we've seen this belt BS go on in other divisions and all the hullabaloo that goes on with it and it not rightfully being someone's and whether they deserve it or not and, you know, whether it's John Jones to DC or Connor to Khabib or come on, come on. At least this way, it's clean, it's an open belt and when the fight happens, it's for that belt. It's none of this interim bullshit and... I'm kind of a Cejudo hater, but I would love to see him in there against Marlon Monroe. Marlon Monroe, and I also think way harder fight for Cejudo than TJ was. Now looking at that fight go down, and now thinking about TJ at 125, and just how I was just so high on TJ, but now knowing he taught me something, and I've seen it more now that fighters have gone down in weight class of like, whoa, 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 stop the clock, like not good for the brain, like you will get knocked right out. Totally so. agree. Totally Anyways, agree. I'm sorry. I had to talk extra because I'm a TJ lover. <laughs> so other fights or any other big news that we've been hearing, that's pretty much been the hottest one. Um, there has been a ton of signings of fights. Ton of, ton of uh, other fun matches. So you said uh, Cowboy Iaquinta, which is surprising to a lot of fans, but I told you that fucking Cowboy Connor was not going to happen. Everybody right. was high on it. I did not think it was going to go down. Joe Rogan opened his big mouth, had to get too much stirring. The other fight that has officially gone on with the weight jump in for Kevin Lee against Junior Dos Santos at 170 pounds. So Kevin Lee's officially moved up from 45 to 55 and now moving up to 170 pounds. Junior Dos Santos? No, Rafael Dos Santos. I was just about to say, oh, I do not like him fighting uh, Junior Shoeface. That's Junior Dos Santos? No, that's... Uh, oh, wait, no. Junior Dos Santos is a big Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. a Carlos Sabato Jr. <laughs> Jr. Um, but Dos Santos no, I was, uh, That's the perfect fight for him to move up to. The guy who's the 155-er, yes. or used to be. Like, I think that is the perfect match for him to go up. And, I mean, everyone beats Dos Santos. At, or, at 70, like, he's a stepping Dos stone, Dos essentially. Yeah, kind of, I mean, for, for a guy that's of the caliber that Lee should be right now. But I am also, and this is going to get me hate, I'm kind of, I think Kevin Lee's talented. I'm glad we'll get to watch him fight. Um, but I kind of think he's a Darren Till where he's always going to hover around the top and we're always going to get to watch great fights from him. But I don't know if he'll ever be a champion. 
I'm going to respectfully disagree and be on the other side. And I think that this is going to be one of those Rocco Martin type of situations. We saw Lee get exponentially better once he moved up to 55. And I think that that now happens at 70 where he's going to be like, I feel stronger than I ever have. And he's going to potentially be able to take more damage, if not just think clear on his feet because he's a muscled up dude. Kevin Lee is not a small 55er. I like him versus Dos Santos or Dos Anjos, but I don't like him uh, against the top top guys of the one seventy. I just am like, whew, I don't. You, but hey, it's fun. Hey, There's fun matchups there. I'm excited for Till to move up. I think that is the best thing Homeboy could do. Is he officially moving up? I I think, in my opinion. Till versus Rockhold at 185 would have been a great fight. But I'm glad Rockhold announced he's moving up and has a fight with. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you off the top he, of my head. I'm going to remember. It's a 205-er, and it just happened. Is it Cannoneer? No. No. It's a bigger fight than that. A 205. It is a bigger Santos? Then that. I haven't. I did see that fight announcement. There's been a bunch of them dropping lately. There's it's been one a lot that you're of like, recent... huh, Rockhold moves up to fight Blagovitz. Oh, that's right. That's a great that's fight. That's a great that's fight. That's perfect. That's a perfect fight for Luke to step in the division against. If he wins, he's an automatic top... Five guy. Top five three. Guy, top... A contender. Yeah. yeah a for, but a contender for the belt immediately. So that that is a great, great fight. And Blagovitz is a huge 205-er. Huge. And he, yeah. Other. He, Andy's gotten bodied up. Um, yeah, the TJ Dillashaw thing. We have more than enough to talk about on this heavy-duty breakdown that we are going to have coming out of Nashville. Yep, I it's just wanted to make deep. sure I didn't have anything else on the Twitter um, that I... Anything that was detrimental that came yeah. up. We did just have Smoliakov, Smoliakov, this uh, MMA fighter coming out of Russia or the Middle East, somewhere, not oh. Middle East, Eastern Europe. I'm so bummed about Fat Tyler. I am really bummed about it. Uh, I am bummed about it. TJ, I know we have so much to talk about. It just really bums me out. <laughs> so, and that is something we're going to have to live with. There we go. I knew there was something we didn't want to. So apparently he is getting help. UFC's come out and said they were willing to support him. And we saw a, ten tap, a pen tapping on Instagram and Twitter. Tony saying, hey, he's at his first psychiatrist appointment and it went well. Champ shit only. So I absolutely love that now Tony Ferguson's wife has also come out specifically after all the rumors were circulating and said he has never been violent once. And we've never been worried for our safety. He's just really weird. And we're like, yeah, we know. We That's, all know that. Everybody knows that. That's why everyone's, the outpour of love that Tony Ferguson has got has been amazing. From everyone. Like, I have to be honest with you. For real. And it's been, like, just emotional time. But when I read Conor McGregor's to Tony, it got me. It got me in my feels. So, I am not, I, I couldn't even read it on air right now. If I, if the fans were like, please read. That should be what I should do. I should put it in my, like, I need my feels out. Let me read Conor McGregor's post to Tony. So, if you guys haven't looked at it yet, go look at it. I don't know why his in particular. Conor McGregor. We talked about the phone thing, but then he was in Boston all hyping uh, proper 12. And he's doing the smartest thing. He's really putting that the same way Jameson is thought of on St. Patrick's Day. He was like, nope, I'm at work. Putting that McGregor brand out there everywhere. Any coverage is good coverage, right? The Great Polly Shore. <laughs> <laughs> by the great Polly Shore. By the great Polly Shore himself. Any cameras are good cameras. Any footage is good footage, and you can turn it and sway it. And Mac is a master at that by far. And I want Tony to get well soon, and I want everything to be handled. And I really even think that everything happens for a reason. His wife loves him. All this coming out and the way it was handled so that no one got injured or Tony didn't get injured. I hear a lot of. Certain other people write into CT, write into CT, write into CT, and there's past history that he actually, which I was like, bing, ding, 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 ding. Uh, he was schizophrenic, maybe, and bipolar. Like he has medication for that. That he's already been diagnosed in his life. Yeah, previously, and was on medication. Wow, yeah, like that definitely things. changes the game. Yes, there's that other he's even been able to keep it story. together enough. 
to be a champion <coughs> and do with that champ life and deal with all the media. But it does help. And that's what I'm overheard. I am not looking at any documents right now. So if it's a little off of that or something, I apologize ahead of time. But I'm a Tony fan. And if that's already happening, I, if he, I don't know that the argument now is should he be able to get in a cage and keep fighting? And I'm like... In time. I don't think we need to jump ahead anytime soon. Like, spur your shit away. But I do think that... He hasn't broken any rules. He hasn't broken any laws. He hasn't done anything. It should be sooner than later if he feels up to it. If he has any standard of med- hesitation, do not. But I feel like I this goes out good. to my our American audience, Latad, here. The police are there to protect and to serve. Protect and to serve. Sometimes that means protect people from themselves. I think we're getting so used to and so, like, it's becoming such a norm of, like, cops, aggression, this, bad, de, de, de. But that's not how it was supposed to be. That's not how the whole thing was set up. So maybe this is, and we're so, we the media feeds us that all cops, bad cops, all cops do bad things. These guys were there. They did their job. They protected Tony and kept him safe. Like, this whole situation, even the way I'm thinking his wife handled it, like, I'm going to get a restraining order for him to take it seriously. And then I'm also going to tell the cops, like, he is one of the deadliest men on the world. Please be careful and just bring more cops. And I just, I kind of love the whole situation, the way it's being handled. Even, like you were saying, the outpouring of love. Totally, totally, totally. So get better out there, champ. We're all rooting for you. Definitely good to see that it's all working out. And that went like three to five minutes past our normal blanter, (laughs) blanter. So out of Nashville, Tennessee, we're going to have a 12-card bout. It's going to be, end up being headlined by Stephen Thompson versus Anthony Pettis at 170 pounds. But you know how we like to do it here at Lap B. We always start from the bottom to the top. And it starts at 125 pounds. The little guys are still getting fights. Rumors for over, I feel like, three to four or five months now talking about 125ers. The division's about to be broken. The division's about to be dissolved. And we got more and more. We even have potential additions coming in here with Jordan Espinoza debuting against vet longtime veteran Eric Shelton. Espinoza has only won his contender series fight as far as official heavy duty competition. He is fighting out of the Albuquerque scene, which is pretty heavy. That Jackson Wink uh, system. Espinoza has good shots, good ground. And pound once he can get you there. Um, the level of competition he fought on the Contender Series wasn't that high. And after three minutes of the first round, even though Espinosa was winning that fight, he was dramatically a different fighter from those first three minutes. And even though he ended up getting the late, late finish in that, <clears throat> it was uh, after those first two minutes, his hands were down on his waist. It was all based on head movement. And somebody who starts to kick those legs out from under him going to really be able to make it a bad night for Espinoza. On the ground, Espinoza likes to roll for Darces. He has really long arms, so he likes to get on top after a sprawl, suck that in. His hips look good for a little while, but he just looks to me like he's got gas tank issues, heavy, heavy duty, and that's on the regional contender series scene. Eric Shelton is one of these guys who's long been tenured, winning and losing one for a while. He's had over six fights in the UFC. Coming off of a win, the... Core Fitness Illinois wrestler has really been able to profile his cardio. Profile is all around game, not a big power puncher, good footwork, good scramble ability, not tons of power. He more kills you by a thousand cuts, but really has a good sprawl and can decide where this fight stands. And striking wise, Shelton doesn't have as much power as um, Espinosa, but Shelton can by far outthink I feel like Espinoza especially now that we've been seeing a lot of these debut guys really starting to get flustered under those bright lights this is usually a stay away here at Lat B and I don't think you necessarily have to do that because I see a decided favorite in Shelton and I see all I after two minutes of the first round this is Shelton's fight to just take over I think he can even score fairly high even though he usually doesn't I'm going to probably stay away from this on DraftKings, uh, but out of the two, it would be Shelton to play here. Who do you have in this fight? I got Shelton decision right now. And why? I also have Shelton decision, but more importantly, Dollywood is in Pigeon Ford. 
for Tennessee. Mm. Um, right on, right on. Uh, and this is embarrassing. Graceland is in Memphis, Tennessee. Woo! <laughs> Not Nashville. Nashville is an also awesome music city, but a great TV show as well. <laughs> That's so, why we're giving it all this street cred <laughs> that it doesn't deserve. <laughs> I think Nashville is a cool city, though. Every it is a great I city. have friends that have lived there for a really long time, and it has um, a good. Uh, if you're into food, it's good. The music scene's fun. The bar scene's fun. Blah, 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 blah. Eric Shelton, in my opinion, he wins everywhere here. But I just think this might be a dirty split. And that's the only reason I stay away from it. Because Eric Shelton seems to always have dirty splits through his whole entire thing. And so why wouldn't this one be any different? And then I look down and a lot of UFC fans, when I look at the percentages on Tapology, they seem more split than they should be, in my opinion. I thought, like you, easily once sided Shelton so I'm like maybe this is a lot be stay away for a reason this guy doesn't necessarily score a lot of points maybe they just clinch up and it becomes a boring 125 fight and that is rare because usually 125ers lay out tons of points I don't know Eric Shelton fights have been known to be a little dull though so I think it might be a stay away but I too have Shelton decision so for what it's worth I don't know what the rest of the card will look like or how much he even is on DraftKings but 8,700 for the favorite Shelton. Nah. Again, 7,500 for Espinosa. On um, DraftKings wise, there, yeah, I'm going to be a big fat stay away from that one. Maybe Shelton on like 10% of my cards, but 8,000, it's Is hard for him. Is he good enough to break a lap B rule? No, he gets in dirty ass splits all the time. So I totally agree. Stay away. At 135 pounds, we have Chris Gutierrez welcoming the debuting. Ryan McDonald, 10 and 0, coming out of that Nebraska scene, the MFC, I believe, network. And he is definitely rough around all of the edges. His striking is serviceable, but his head is on a straight line. That straight up head movement, that moving your head straight back and just staying out of range, uh, using your length instead of actual footwork and the UFC doesn't tend to work well for these guys because fighters know how to adapt and step in extra hard and hit you with the right and eventually put you down so the level of competition for Ray McDonald or Ryan McDonald has been super super low caliber he did just get a submission but he was rocked in pretty much every one of the fights I that, that I ended up watching his win over Matt Murphy that was seven and nine that was a slop fest. Murphy kept throwing a straight right that kept landing and he dropped uh, McDonald three times in the first round. But then um, somehow McDonald just kept grappling and grinding in the second round. Literally, Murphy said, I don't want to fight anymore and retired in the Eek. corner. That's an under 500 fighter. That's the level of competition that McDonald's fighting. So ultra low level. Gutierrez is 12 and 3. He's definitely uh, had a bit more experience beating or losing to his debut against Ronnie Barsolis, who's an immediate contender at 135, but winning his LFA championship out against Ray Rodriguez via submission. Um, here, the better move, head movement, better striking, better leg kicks is Gutierrez. On the ground, I also think Gutierrez has a much better ground game. And can eat a punch way better. I just see way more check marks. But again, this is fairly low level. Uh, if there's a place to play, it's going to be Gutierrez. The minus 155 favorite. I'm not going to expose myself anywhere to McDonald. I think he probably goes two or three in a row. And then out of the UFC, honestly. Didn't like anything I saw from the young man. Who do you have in this fight and why? I'm going to stay away from this fight, too. I have Gutierrez's decision, and I wanted to have a, but more importantly, and then some fun fact about Tennessee. Um, <laughs> but then I was listening to what you were saying <laughs> about everything because I really don't know enough about these fighters, and I like to stick with what I know. So I've only seen one of these guys fight in the UFC once. I was not impressed, so I will not put it anywhere, but I have him to win by decision. So Chris Gutierrez on DraftKings is 8,300 against McDonald's 7,900. 
McDonald. I remember what I was going to do. I was yes. going to look because I was like, is this a setup fight? And my new way of whether or not I think it's a setup fight is, does the UFC have an event coming in Nebraska that they need Ryan McDonald to win this so that they can bring a hometown boy into Nebraska? But then I'm like, I don't feel like looking all that up. But, <laughs> um, and, then, and then I was like listening that, oh, okay, Gutierrez, leg kicks. All right, I like you, I like you. What, what's also happening, why I really didn't like, is McDonald tends to throw wo- Three punch combinations, but they do start to get telegraphed, and he throws blind kicks. Why everybody has been able to land a right hand on McDonald is because he throws a kick and puts his hands down and doesn't stop, doesn't block anything. So look for an overhand right to land early. So I actually might go TKO round number one or wow. two. Gutierrez, the more I'm breaking it down, it's just this McDonald guy. He is a local, local-ish native. He's out of that scene Nebraska, yeah, he's a Nebraska boy. He was one of the guys locally, and one of his his last fight where he won Tennessee, his championship. Nebraska is Tennessee. Oh, little different, little different. But it's right there. It's right there. <laughs> the neighbors, like I mean, it's like it's Georgia, like, Florida. Yeah, close, close enough. Your There's relatives can come watch. Your exactly. relatives drove there to it's watch. It's a two hour drive yeah. potentially wherever <laughs> they're from. So I'm moving it up. TKO round number two, Gutierrez. I think a light right hand lands. I'm switching that. 8-3, though, for Gutierrez. I think I'm going to play him there. McDonald, zero. McDonald, absolutely nowhere. I have a Gutierrez decision, but he just hasn't really impressed me so much yet in there. And he has gone against guys with legitimate records. Uh... I just think corn-fed guy, he might be able to eat punches and do some kind of crazy Superman he thing can until eat the three. So if he can just be a punching bag, that's the only reason I don't have a Gutierrez finish. But maybe he's just going to go in there and clean him out. Like, look at McDonald's the favorite on Tabology. No way. 67% of people have him to win by some, you know, not Interesting. Plus 125 underdog is McDonald's. That's closer than it should be. Like, listening to you talk about it, that's closer than I it should I agree with that. Gutierrez isn't that much better, though. I don't think Gutierrez ever I had McDonald's run. submission when before he started oh, talking. Oh, interesting. I... I'm just saying well, from the tape that I watched. But I, I yeah, don't, I I don't look just, at lines. Yeah, I don't. I didn't watch any tape. I was just looking oh. at his record. I don't know anything. So I'm going to stick Trash with what games. I know. Gartierrez. I don't. Or Seven and Gartierrez. nine fighter retired in the corner. I'm not into it. I'm not into this fight. Stay away. <laughs> Stay away from this fight maybe is the best advice there. At 115 pounds, we have two tenured fighters coming in here. Ronda Marcos versus Angela Hill. This is a UFC tough house Fight that never happened in the tough house. They could have met, didn't, but uh, Ronda Marcos has been having a mixed record in the UFC, being eight and six and one. Was it a draw her last fight? Was that what ended up happening uh, against Marina Rodriguez? Majority decision, or did somebody pop in there? I don't um, remember. I think it might have been a draw. She, I believe it was a draw. Before that, know. she ended up losing to Nina Asnarov, but has definitely gotten wins in there against Juliana Lima. And Carla Esparza's split decision is probably her best one in there. Losing to Alexis Grasso in a split decision, really, really interesting seeing Alexis Grasso's now biggest issues being on the ground and easily exploited. Ronda Marcos tends to be that striker. She is an Iranian wrestler, went over to uh, TriStar and has been there ever since. But good Instagram follow. She's always training, always in the gym. Likes to use that double single leg takedown. She likes to go for a double, switches it to a single, puts in heavy, but when people really stuff her head to the ground, she loses all of that forward momentum and just gets laid on top of. And against lower level competition, she's really able to outwork that wrestling. And Esparza isn't, I guess, that low. But as of late, I've just really seen her takedowns almost get worse. Um, I don't, and Nina Asgaroff, we've been touting here for a while. She's been a big underdog and it's because that takedown defense. And against Angela Hill, that's exactly everything she's been tightening up. That's when when she left the UFC and then came back, she ha- exploit she found out the exploitations in her game, which was a takedown game, and has gotten better at it. She isn't perfect, but she's definitely coming off of a loss to eight and five fighter. Last loss to Courtney Casey in a split decision, which was all striking. Beat Marina Moroz in a decision. Also lost to Nina Asnarov, and has losses to Andros beating Yoder as well. But she's a Muay Thai striker in there. She likes to uh, 
keep it standing at distance, has good teep kicks. In the clinch is much better than she lets on, but I feel like she doesn't want to be in the clinch against wrestlers because they'll usually switch levels, get the look double leg takedown in there. So I think this actually stays at distance. I think Angela Hill can keep this where she wants it. And striking wise, she's a level above Ronda Marcos. Ronda Marcos leans in with too hard, a too hard punch combination, but she leaves her head right behind it and moves on a straight line where I think Angela Hill has learned a little bit more of angles. She's not a master by any means, but uh, I think that this actually turns into a bloody war and it's more Ronda Marcos getting picked apart. I think it's kills her by a thousand cuts. I have Decision Hill. I don't think this is a heavy scorer either way. I'm going to probably end up staying away from it, but I do have the slight favorite here. Who do you have in this fight and why? Ronda Marcos hasn't shown up for a long time. I keep wanting her to show up, and even against Lima, it was just like Lima fell out harder than her. It wasn't because Ronda decided to show up. I kind of feel like Angela Hill... I've been watching her progress and grow every time I'm watching her in there, even if she's losing the fight. The people she's losing against, who, Jessica and Draj, are you kidding me? Who, Nina Asternoff, are you kidding me? Exactly. Like, the people that she's losing against and who gets even no credit, Courtney Casey split decision. Courtney came out and looked like the best version of Courtney Casey that she's ever looked like. So, the best version of Courtney Casey eked out a split with Angela Hill that some people feel like Angela won. I just, I've... Part of Angela Hill's problem, uh, she kind of reminds me of like a point, she's a point fighter, but her cardio is getting better and better and better and better. And somewhere in the last few years, it switched on her of her, what she's good at and where she doesn't go anymore. And I watch her come out now in the third round and still have pep in her step and still look like, oh, okay, she's still here. She's still, if you do that with Randa, I feel like you could just wear her out. She kind mm -hmm. of, it's not that she gives up in there. She just becomes very complacent and she just, it, it, it shows all of a sudden, like the whole fight just stalemates. And I just can see Angela Hill staying away from her enough. Just keep pecking away those points, kept pecking away those points. Like you were saying, I also don't see it being very high scoring but I do see Hill getting a decisive decision here I don't think there's a question even if you look at the pattern of their records it's time for Angela Hill to win it so for all those reasons Angela Hill decision 8,200 for the minus 155 favorite in Angela Hill against Ronda Marcos's plus 125 underdog 8,000 on DraftKings if there's a side to play there it's gonna be Hill well, sorry about that it's gonna be Hill but Again, you're going to only... be me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only going to do like 40% because this is going to be like 60 points in a win. Yeah. How much? What? 8-4 you said? 8-2. Eight, 8-2. Two. Eight, two. So it's a coin flip as far as DraftKings is concerned. Yeah, and I really don't see Angela Hill getting more than that unless she finishes. And have we ever seen Angela Hill finish? Not too much. Maybe early, early on. Not in this UFC level. And we've seen Ronda be able to take a beating and keep moving forward even to lose a decision in there. So I don't think, as you're saying, she necessarily gives up. But she does get, I think you said it right, complacent in there. And Hill's the better thinker in the cage. At 125 pounds, we have returning Alexis Davis against Jennifer Maya. Maya is 15 and 6. Five and one. She's coming off of her debut in the UFC off of her Invicta run, losing to Liz the Gorilla Carmouche in a decision eight months ago. Maya uh, definitely likes to keep it striking. Has multiple decisions, majority decisions out of the Invicta scene, split decisions, but all these are somewhat caliberish women. We definitely know once they get to the UFC, it's the next level in there. And Maya likes to keep it striking on the ground. She's not necessarily a fish out of water, but she just more uses her jiu-jitsu defensively instead of really attack. So she's not a real danger on the ground. Um, once she's already got that first fight out from under her and lost to Liz Carmouche, I do see that we have the potential growth more so in the 30-year-old where she's going to be able to have a big jump in her technique because she might realize like, oh, this is what I got to do. Liz Carmouche by far is going to be the best grappler she had ever faced. And she didn't get finished in there, which is a level of accomplishment someone in there. Against Alexis Davis, she's definitely a lady that all the way around, jack of all trades, master of none, but usually uses her wrestling to win decisions. Liz, or Alexis Davis has been a longtime veteran who's used her savviness her veteranship to exploit other women's weaknesses, and that's definitely the ground game for Maya. 
Alexis Davis does a really good level change where she'll throw, she'll get lull you into a, a tapping strikes and then shoot in for a double leg takedown. And she likes to step over that back knee, get you to the ground. I tend to love that takedown. Alexis Davis does it well. The only thing is that at 34 with a long history and a long career at 19 and 8, her knees have been shot for a while. So those takedowns, the reason she steps behind that knee is because she doesn't have the force to keep stepping through and running through like a football tackle, which, hey, it's smart. It's, to me, it's just she's thinking about what she needs to do. On the ground, Alexis Davis, though, she will go over position over submission and just kind of let you roll under yourself, weigh yourself out, and win a one-sided decision, which I feel like Davis is going to end up getting. A lot of people see this happening as well think it's a rerun of kind of the Carmouche, just maybe not as controlled as Carmouche did it. But I'm going to side with the favorite here. I'm going to say stay away because I see this being ultra lower scoring. If there's a takedown, it's Alexis Davis getting maybe two to three takedowns, but it's a one takedown and then the fight stays there. And then there's rabbit punches, but again, minimal. It's just kind of her working up. So again, this is going to be a stay away as far as drafting points. Who do you have in this fight and why? I also have the favorite here, and more so just because, in my opinion, the 135 weight class was never right for Alexis Davis. She, her body never looked good there against far bigger women, far stronger women. So I feel like here she's a little more in her weight class. Chukagian, uh she's for all intents and purposes in that top three in the division i've been listening to everybody else tout off about who are the top three and she's up there so that loss isn't a big deal to me and then losing to sarah mcmahon i'll also say for all intents and purposes of any hardcores out there that was like when sarah mcmahon was in her fucking high like she was looking like the bomb ass sarah mcmahon like she looked like the sarah mcmahon we were all expecting her body to be there to do like this is what this woman's gonna do rip through submission she has good wrestling she's gonna take these women down submit them submit them she's gonna be one to watch in the division she just never got that like hunger Alexis Davis, it's not that she has it. She just has been in there so many times. I have her to finish. I just think she could also submit because of the far bigger strength woman. If she's in with a smaller lady, uh, what she might be able to pull off as far as that Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is concerned. So um, Jennifer Maya, I don't know if she doesn't excite me. I don't know how much this division excites me. I'm a I'm more excited for this fight than I should be. I actually don't think this is the one on the card. You make the sandwich or do the thing. I think this could get interesting. Uh, yeah, Davis' decision. I'm not going to put another woman anywhere. I don't think it's going to be high scoring. Like 8, you were saying, it's submission or position over submission. But I, I, I can see Alexis Davis maybe pulling out the submission. Maybe because I would, out of the two. strength might be able to pull it out in a way that she couldn't with the bigger women at one thirty five. I don't know why I just but felt I this. I got to put this bad juju out there. I'm sorry, but I could totally see one of these weird cat zingano, uh, a kick, kick to the eye, or a knee that just bursts on a weird Cain Velasquez slip with Davis. Like because the old guard were just watching him get weird. They're out of there. She's thirty four. She's not that old, but I just feel like and at this division they're not taking the head trauma. Right. Like or at one thirty five, unless they're fighting Amanda Nunes, and she did not fight Amanda Nunes. As far as I guess what I'm trying to say there is Maya at seven thousand six hundred is pretty much got a only a lucky win in there out of the two. If there's like a controlled finish, it's probably going to be on. I think the odds are dead on though. I think she shouldn't be too heavy of a favorite, but a little bit of a favorite. Her experience should give her the edge. Eight thousand six hundred on DraftKings. Are you putting Davis anywhere? No. Yeah, agreed. Not at all, or Maya for that matter at all. At 135 pounds, we have Marlon Chito Vera versus Frankie Zanes. This has been rebooked a few times. We thought we were going to see it months and months ago, but for whatever reason, was it either Zane, first Zanes and then Vera? Like, they booked it once, Zanes had a dropout day of, and then they booked it again, and then Vera had to drop out, or it could be reversed there. But I feel like... I think you're right, though. I think it was uh, last time it was Vera. Like, so, if it yeah. doesn't happen this time, you guys both got to move on and get other fights. We can't have another Tony Kabuto yeah, situation. 100%. All of a sudden, Marlon will be tripping on a wire and then be thinking <laughs> of microchips in his knee. We don't need any of this, people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, too soon. So, Hashtag too soon, I know. We broke this down quite a few times, I feel like, and it keeps going 
going down to Frankie Zanes has definitely looked like a shell of himself at 38 years old. He's off of a two-fight winning streak being 12-5 and five against Chito Vera, who's looked better than he ever has coming off of a two-fight winning streak. Um, Vera's just putting it all together, has the better kicks, does gas a little bit more, but is willing to throw it out there by throwing, jumping, uh, switch knees and jumping kicks because he, Vera's not as worried about going to the ground because Vera will throw up some nasty triangles arm bars off of his back where Sainz, Sainz tends to be the wrestler, the straight up boxer, not much of a kicker at all whatsoever. So I feel like Vera here has way more tools in his uh, box, in his basket, and he's more willing to uh, throw it out there. Those Saints can turn this into a decision drag out lull of a fight where he just kind of tries to go for that position. But this might be one of those options where we keep seeing Chito Vera getting taken down, but he ends up doing so much damage which with elbows off of his back or throwing up submissions that the refs might even, the judges might even give it to him off of his back. So I got the decided favorite here. I've had it from day one. Didn't need to go too heavy into it because we've talked about it forever. Give me Chito Vera, the minus 180 favorite. Who do you have in this fight and why? Oh my gosh. It's, it's not even just because it's a fade on Zane's because if you actually look at his record, he's not getting brutally finished in there. And everyone, he did get the hard one brutal hard finish. But other than that, uh, He's been solid in there. He's been a solid pick in there, and I've actually gone against him too many times. Mm -hmm. But Cheeto is my man. I never go against Cheeto Vera. I would say Cheeto Vera's in my top ten. Like, now Zane it on a... I want to have a top ten. Like, when oh. we do the new studio, I think it'd be cool if we had little slide printer things where we had our own top ten and we could For every weight out. class or just do we do our own Just our top half. ten uh, thing, and they could stay, and we could talk about them occasionally, but it would be a big deal if you were, like... If you watch someone fight and you're like, well, I'm taking someone out of my top 10 and moving my list around. Or if something happens over there, that like a new fight, and you're like, I love someone now. I'm putting them in my top 10. I think oh, just the Lesbo top 10, the Bean top okay, 10, whatever. Okay. I know it's a weird like one, it. but I really love Cheeto. I can't go against him. I like everything he's doing in there. He's growing, he's growing, he's growing. Frankie Zanes is a perfect fight to put in front of him because if he can overcome that ground game, I actually like what you're saying. Elbows off his back, elbows off his back. Um, Maybe the same cursed fight that that we um and that we uh, talked about to compare this to Khabib Ferguson maybe it'll look a lot like what we anticipated happening with Khabib <laughs> Ferguson and we'll get to vicariously live through our little Cheeto Vera Vera decision though I don't see a finish I don't see a finish for Cheeto because I think Sainz has a better chin than he's getting credit for he just had a brutal fucking knockout I actually had decision moved it up to finish round number three just because I do feel like Vera will headhunt, try to get those uh, performance bonuses because he's had a few and yeah. he likes them. He likes them. You see him in that last minute. Cheeto Vera is a future cowboy or a future. Oh, like He's one of these guys that he is so young. He's 26 years but old. I feel like, listen, it's either the minute or 30 second mark of uh, Cheeto's corner where he likes to tell his corner, let me know when there's a minute because he knows I can leave it out there. And he does let it out there. And that's why we tend to like Chito Vera. Because he doesn't just... Uh, he's not okay with just sitting back on the decision. He tries to finish the fight. So I got a TKO round number three. You know what I can see the decision. Really well? Yes, He puts strikes together with submissions. Like, mm -hmm. he actually puts up his... His his ground game mixed with his striking game is all... I, I can't tell what he's better at. He's right. getting so good at both. I love Cheeto. Hashtag one to watch. But Eight, we always say that. You guys know. <laughs> 8,400 on DraftKings for Cheeto Vergan. 7,800 for Zanes. Uh, I'm playing Cheeto. Oh, that's probably my linchpin. What's his average? 66 points against 62 for Frankie Zanes average. He's going to probably get right around that 70 point mark. Frig. A lot of the people I like, even in the, uh, they, they aren't high, high scorers like we've been used to. Not a lot of knockout artists we've talked about yet. A lot of smaller guys, which don't tend to be knockout artists. But something you just said, that a linchpin, there is always, we both always have one every fight night where it's like that person that's on 90%, 80% of your cards. Right, 85%. Can't be 90 so much because 
Woo! That Still left with the being underdog, Heinich. Oh. Uh, when that fell out, that I didn't realize how much of a linchpin it was for me until it of fell out. Every single one of my cards. Me too. Every because single one. Because you agreed. We, we agreed. It, it even made me feel For an that, underdog? Yeah. Oh, it was heavy duty. So, definitely, uh, I agree. 90% of my cards were probably going to have Vera just so I don't fully, you know, hedge my bets. I'll end up mixing it up in there with other ha people being the sixth man in there. So... On to 145ers, we have Bobby Moffitt coming in against Bryce Mitchell, Mr. S Ripped Sack himself, Bryce Mitchell. Do you remember that whole screwdriver debacle? No, please. Oh, uh, he sack. was doing some uh, renovations in his home and he was in his boxer shorts with, you know, his uh, belt and he was holding the drill in between his legs and the drill went off and rolled up his nutsack and ripped his nutsack open and he posted. I don't even have a nutsack and it just made me like <laughs> he rushed to the hospital <sighs> I had a hard posted swallow. his bloody underwear boxes I do on remember there. it now yeah. Oh, yeah I remember so he's definitely coming off of his win losing in the ultimate fighter but beating Tyler Diamond in I the remember majority in decision. that sad voice I remember I it's remember. the exact opposite of never forget <laughs> True, true, I true. Remember. Do you think he ever holds that drill in between his legs ever again? Oh. He's a redneck. He's a squirrel hunting. For some reason, I'm looking at him, and I feel like that's not going to be the only time he puts bloody underwear online. <laughs> <laughs> that is too funny. The he he has some sort of moniker. I what? It's not his nickname. Thug nasty. It is thug nasty, but he's also like a. He's like a ghetto redneck, or he calls himself something like that, because he likes to live off the land, hunts every single day for his meat and protein, and can live off of the land as soon as the apocalypse comes. So, good to know. He's a wild man in there. Throws all sorts of grambies when he's on the ground. Big time scrambler. Striking-wise, it's developing. He's got a little bit of power in there. Solid left hand. Switches stances in there. Um, everything they like for the 24-year-old. He's growing. I guess the things that I would like to see more from him is him getting out of Arkansas a bit more. I don't know if he's officially went to other camps yet, but I do know he likes to stay near home. And I just can't say that I know too many other fighters coming out of Barata MMA in Arkansas. Agree. So it's just like, ugh. In these divisions with monsters at 145 pounds, you got to get exposure. Go to some heavy-duty camps. Eventually come back to your camp once you've learned a lot because I like a lot of these UK guys that we saw go to ATT, Dykesi and stuff, learned what they needed to, but were getting eaten alive by so many of these big guys that once they went back home and actually rested and absorbed, they looked like new men. I think Mitchell could gain from something like that. And here against Bobby Moffitt, the 14-3 and three fighter is coming off of a huge win. Darth Choke four months ago against Chad Skelly, winning his debut against... Kilburn, prior to that, the 14-3 and three fighter, beat all sorts of other fighters out of the Illinois scene as well. He's gone to decision a few times. Definitely uses his striking to get to the ground. Bobby Moffitt on the ground is a monster. Is an absolute monster. He latches onto that leg. He's coming out of the MMA lab. He likes to throw a a slick left jab into an overhand right, but it sets it up a lot like Gunnar Nelson, uh, except without the karate style. He actually drives through and knows how to chain wrestle once he gets to those hips and has been in trouble for everybody on the ground. Bobby Ma Chas Kelly is not an easy guy to submit in there, and he went in there and worked Yeah, that all wasn't over a him. walkthrough fight. No, not at all. Not at all. Moffitt really showed through in there. I saw some of his earlier fights as well. He's been able to eat a couple heavy shots, and I've liked his IQ. As soon as Moffitt gets hurt, he goes directly for that takedown. And Tyler, not, not Tyler, uh, Bryce Mitchell actually enjoys Fat to Tyler, go to the ground. <laughs> I was thinking of that exact same thing of actually right when you said that, I was thinking how TJ Dillashaw, he gets hurt, goes for that single leg. Right when you said it, and then it's like I sent it to you. I thought Fat Tyler. I didn't think TJ. Interesting. And then you said Tyler. So you mixed me up there, but uh, Mitchell likes to <laughs> doesn't have the best takedown defense, likes to go to the ground, and against Tyler Diamond, his last opponent in it, it was a oh, majority decision. Why. Yes. He was... Uh, it was a really scrappy fight, but it was really low caliber. And there was a lot of scrambles, but against higher level competition, better submission guys, 
Mitchell leaves his arms and head in and neck in a little tighter. And sometimes it's his toughness has had to show through instead of his fight IQ. So for that reason, I'm siding with the minus 170 favorite. I just feel like Mitchell likes to stay on the ground more. He's more comfortable than he needs to be there. And Moffitt on the ground is just a motherfucker. Motherfucker. I think he turns. He uses this really awesome quarter power turn that we use in wrestling that I saw over the London card being used as well. I feel like... Uh, that looks like yeah. that Ben Askren. Yeah, it, tur it turns it under and then he sinks the Dars through and goes over a top Dars Ninja Choke. Moffat uses that fucking slickly. So you don't slickly. think so, but when we have the stand-up table, yeah. that... Well, I'm going to be Brian Callen up in this That's bitch. what I think. We'll like, Double side yeah, <laughs> well, I think it'll matter because, you know, we <laughs> welcome, like, everybody else is like, hardcores, hardcores, hardcores. We're like, we welcome the casuals because uh, he taught me, so why can't he teach you if you don't know that much about fighting? So I think those kind of things, when you're doing them and you're like, can explain it a little bit, that would have been one of those examples. But, um, yeah, not to take away any of that, I feel like Bobby Moffitt got a little more hurt than I would have liked to see in his last fight against Chaz Scully, you guys. Chaz Scully isn't a walkthrough in the UFC. He is an MFer. He is a good fighter that I probably had money on in that fight because I'm like, oh, this is, I'm going to stick with what I know. Chaz Scully all day, 100%. and I felt confident with it. Bobby Moffitt did better than I expect. He took a lot more damage than I would have liked to see him take if he was the person I would have gone with. But he still ended up pulling out that Darce the second it got there. I'm giving Bryce Mitchell a little credit that he can stay away from him and keep his wits about him for that first round and not get submitted. And maybe even win a round. But I don't think he can do it for two rounds. It's a lot of big deal. And I'm hoping after this loss, Bryce Mitchell changes camps, takes a little money from his second UFC fight and changes camps like you're saying. And I would even say, who do I have more potential for in the future for UFC? It's Bryce Mitchell all day. I actually really like him. I like his personality. I like his heart in there. I like everything I'm seeing. I just think he needs that professional next level training. Um, exactly what you're saying. But Bobby Moffitt... He's kind of a one-trick pony. It just happens to be a one-trick that's going to work in this fight. So Moffat submission round two. I have Moffat decision right now. I could see that submission eventually getting there. On DraftKings, the heavy favorite is going to be 8,800 against Mitchell's 7,400. Are you going to have much exposure to this fight? You do have a submission, so that's going to pay off I do over have a 90 submission. points. I'm only going to put it probably on 30% of my cards because I, like I want to stick with my la my lesbo rule of stick with what I know. And I don't know either fighter that well yet. And either could surprise me with doing something crazy. So Moffat, I'll speckle. And Bryce, I'll stay away from him for now, but I do have a feeling he's going to be a sneaky underdog for me in the future the second I hear he change camps. I totally agree with that 100%. There is definitely a ton of potential for both young men in here and this is a profile fight it's a reason it's going to be the profile prelim it's going to end up being on espn plus check your local listing sky sports bt2 if you know what i'm talking about how do you feel about espn now re-upping for another two years and exclusively holding the pay-per-view selection for the ufc now does this change anything for you um, I do think I'm officially going to get rid of my fight pass. And even though I really love fights and everything, I just can't afford it. I'd rather give my Patreon money to, um, those conspiracy guys, Whoop. um, or other podcasts that I listen to. So I'm not, I don't want to give my money to the UFC to watch fights. I could pull up on YouTube and at least give to the fighter who probably has the YouTube channel and he can get at least the money for me watching his fight over the UFC, just owning everything. So, um, and the prelim fights, I'll just pull them up on some other something or I don't know. I just don't see myself keeping it for two fights every six months or every three months. I totally agree. It's probably the one that I'm, I'm going to be cutting more than sun. I don't care. And I use it because I watch tapes, so there is times yeah. where I'm like, 
Oh, it, thank it is goodness. easier. They're thank cleaner. Goodness. They're high def. I love being able to look up everything about UFC. Like even these tickets, I right. got them through the UFC website. How do you feel about your ESPN stream? How has it been working out for love you as it. of late? Love it. The only thing I don't like is the repetitiveness of the commercials. I could even deal with slight commercials sometimes, but not the same commercial every time with a song. My other criticism, other than the commercials and the same thing going over of uh, Hey Sarah, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is if somebody flips somebody off in there or curses, I'm paying essentially a private subscription. I should be an adult. You don't have to censor it. I felt like there was multiple finger flips that happened and all of a sudden my pan away and I was like, what? Did they just censor that? Who cares? Agree. I'm like, paying let me, money. I'm paying I'm money. I'm an adult, not a kid. A kid shouldn't be paying you. That's your guys' issue. I'm an adult. Let them Or curse. there should be a switch. That that block yeah, go on, so I don't want it on. I yeah, don't want because you it buffered to, my I don't want sheet. you to block out if Nate Diaz says, I ain't surprised. I don't want that. Oh, we curse on this show. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, we curse on I this wanted show. to say the whole thing. I don't want it to be <laughs> boop or blocked out. Like, I want to see the dick. If somebody drops their pants, if somebody gets I want to see the dick. <laughs> Splits the seam of their shorts. <laughs> yes. I, I if totally somebody agree. doo-doo on the mat, I want to see the doo-doo. <laughs> that's why totally I totally agree. That's why we pay. That's if, what I'm saying. If Habib jumps into the audience. I don't want it to just go black and be like. Boo! Totally. Like, if somebody's serving up a three piece with a soda, I want to watch. I want to watch it. But this is the other thing that the UFC did right that maybe ESPN could take. And ESPN, we know you listening. So something that you guys could do that the uh, UFC app did or the Fight Pass is you could pick corner to listen to. And I think that option is next level brilliant. Let me be able to pick what corner I want to listen to instead of you deciding if I can do that, like pick a story where it gives me one camera angle or the other at the bottom. Love it. I don't even care. Charge me an extra dollar a month so I don't have any commercials. And I just get to watch the whole, there's, you don't break away for a minute. I get to pick a corner. Light bulb, ESPN plus. Hero Lesbo and the version. Oh. <laughs> or no, just because the extra dollar is like the hero or like the plus one. Yeah, they should give it something. Plus else. one. Yeah. Uh, ESPN and a date. Yeah. <laughs> ESPN ain't coming so low. ESPN a busting bad tonight all up in the... ESPN getting someone pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, so if hopefully not. Yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> If you're not liking and subscribing, be sure to add Zoltanite. Are Zoltanite. we main card already? We are already into the main card. Follow Zoltanite at Weeknight Baby at Lesbo and the Bean to get all of our official news. There's going to end up being free bets posted. I don't know about some props. This is a favorite friendly card. I do feel like in general, this is one of them I'm going to lean back from a little bit. I'm going to lean it on back. I feel like it's hard to make money in these spots. I don't see a lot of heavy underdogs there is a couple not a lot but uh just something to be noted this is thrown together like a green card wedding (laughs) (laughs) this card down to the main event is thrown together like oh shit homegirl three months pregnant (laughs) (laughs) oh shit we We did it we we filled it let's go yeah and a way to start before before we get to the main card please we took our commercial off the beginning so we could drop it now So, because we figure if you're still here, then maybe you're interested on getting a deal at latherandcompany.com. And if you like soap, and you've told me about Matt Soap, what happens if you wrestle and you have soap with too many weird antibiotic chemicals? Definitely, you are more exposed to fungal infections if you're using antibiotic or antibacterial. Your skin flora naturally needs a resistant and you need those microbes on there because they'll fight off staph infection and types of ringworm. Now, this doesn't mean don't be a nasty ass. Wash your mats, but also wash your ass. Wash your ass and you can do that with Lather & Co. They have organic stuff that's made with good... You're, it's not all antibacterial. It's not all these weird chemicals you can't even pronounce that you're putting on your skin. They have bath palms. They have... Yes, things for the ladies. You can get it for your moms and daughters and whoever else. But you can also... They have masculine stuff too that makes you smell good. Why can't you smell good? I totally agree. You like to smell good? What happens when you smell good if you smell good to your lady? Everybody likes someone who smells good. Get a little extra love on the side this is an official commercial so i could say you might get 
steak and a dick suck. <laughs> steak and a dick suck. Someone will come up to you and you be like, oh my gosh, you smell like a delicious uh, ember of fire and cigar. I have to be with you right now. Give me that dick. <laughs> That's the official. That's the Lesbo endorsement. Just yeah. throwing that Give out me there. That dick. <laughs> I was gonna more say like Tony Ferguson. You might have Mike. Lather, <laughs> Lather and Co. is cruelty free. That is true. Like so. Tony Ferguson, Lather and Co. Um, is cruelty free. That is a perfectly. With all of their products, there is no. They deeply go into their research, so you can know that there is no monkeys getting their homes run down. In any of that their is products. true. No monkeys are getting homes run down to have any of the ingredients of their products going in. So if you go to latherandcompany.com, make sure you put in L A T B fifteen to get the Lesbo and the Bean fifteen percent off. And if you live in the United States, you will get free shipping and handling for orders of twenty five dollars or more. Sorry about all of our friends in the UK, but we ain't got no fans in Italy, so that don't matter to the Italians. That don't matter to the Italians yet. Shade. Shame. Shade. Shame. Shame. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing that 50 shades of gray to the Italians. So, anyways, latherandcompany.com. I think that was a good commercial. I love it. I love it. The main card opens up with a profile fight at 125 pounds. We have J.J. Aldridge coming in against Rising Superstar. I thought the live commercial was more fun. It is more fun. <laughs> we'll see totally how interesting we can keep it every time. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to have, see what Lather & Co. thinks of it. Yeah, we're going to have to see what Lather & Co. thinks about it. But the bean is on the side of, I like what it went <laughs> down in that Speaking live air <laughs> But she's coming in against the super prospect in Macy Barber. We all saw her coming off of that Contender Series fight, winning her debut decisively against Hannah Cyphers, who all of a sudden looks a whole lot tougher than we thought, winning with a broken arm, being a big underdog in her last fight. J.J. Aldridge, though, being 7-2, and two, she's a veteran as well, beating Paula Anna Vienna seven months ago, beating Danielle Taylor, which is way harder than most people give credit to, only losing in the UFC to Juliana Lima in a decision, but Aldridge has put together a great, great repertoire. She likes to keep it striking at a distance. She's very Chukagian-esque in there, uses her takedown defense to keep it striking, keep you on the outside, throws together a good little jab, just kind of touches you up, ha, 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 in there, uh, keeps some good shit, tries to not get hit too much. And on the ground, Aldridge is serviceable. She's not a fish out of water by any means whatsoever. Um, has good transitions, has good roll-throughs, good sweeps, saw some good inside butterfly traps. It. She's not going to submit you, but she is at least able to get you thinking enough on the ground that you can't necessarily be attacking all the time. So Aldridge is a live, live dog in here as a big underdog. I don't necessarily see that. I see the hype train in Macy Barber because her striking's on point from a distance. She's essentially the karate hottie with power at 125 pounds, but she has that killer instinct. What here we like to talk about mm -hmm. with Chito Vera, Macy Barber has that. That's why we like to like people like her. She's one of those that even if she's winning a sided decision, she's throwing deadly elbows from the top. She's always trying to pass moves. She understands that she needs to finish. And she, she got a little bit of that Johnny Walker. She got a little bit of that John Jones. She got a little bit of that hunger. Yes, like, she there's does. Something she about it. Like, searches for the finish. She got that star quality. Definitely, definitely. So this is definitely a tough fight, and a lot of season people see why for Aldridge, as do I. I think that. Even on the ground, Macy looked like a little beast in there. All of her transitions look good. She looks heavy on the hips. Aldridge, I don't think, throws up anything that Macy... She is the more veteran fighter, but she's still young at 26 against Macy's. 20 years old. 20. 20, but she's one of these... Sage Northcutt who? She's one of these decorated... I don't want to... I can't remember the specific discipline if it's Taekwondo or Karate, but she's a lifelong martial artist, long, lifelong competitor. So she's grown up with MMA in her back. She grew up on Ronda and has evolved from that. So I see the better all-around MMA fighter right now just being Macy Barber, but I think a lot of people see that. And I think Macy finished this, this with elbows in the third. I think that even in the second, if she's winning the first two rounds, she's like, I don't care, coach. I want to get in there and get a finish in. Uh, that's why she's going to be a betting favorite for, for a long time. Who do you have in this fight and why? I have Macy Barber as well. 
but I see this as actually the fight that gets her to that next level that I think I, I'm just guessing she's stunted a little where right now she feels like she can be everyone I think we see frustration for the first time for Macy Barber in this first round coming out. I actually think J.J. Aldridge isn't a walkthrough in this division at all. I think she's a very tough competitor and she's very well-rounded. Is she as good as Macy Barber? Does she have the tenacity to like jump in there? I think that tenacity is eventually going to get J.J. down and on the ground is where Macy's going to lay elbows and do some really dirty work. I think she has a heavy ground and pound and a great far away. It's the divisions in between where J.J. might be able to pick her and then jump on the far outside. Pick her and jump on the far outside. I think she has okay defense. She's well-rounded enough to frustrate Macy, but I think if she listens to her coaches and coaches and stays calm and goes in there, I think Macy could even lose round two because I also think it's going to be the first time she has to really check her cardio. But this is going to be the fight that lets me know how to jump on the Macy hype train going forward where I'll be all aboard. One of the things that made me like, yeah, everybody was on it. Everybody was, you know, like people were talking about her and I really jumped on it. <laughs> yeah, and I really like her. I loved everything I saw. But watching Cyphers in her last fight and watching what Cyphers took and then have the broken arm, it really gave me an idea. It wasn't a walkthrough opponent like we see a lot of these girls yeah. get. Cyphers legit. Like she's somebody to watch for in the division going forward. So it really made me like, whoa, Macy didn't just come in and against some uh, scrap like we seen before she Which came in thought. against the legit opponent yeah we did at the time and she handled her yep. so um to watch somebody get a broken arm to still be finished now knowing what we know about B- macy barber i think she's going to finish her in the third i think it takes her about three rounds to figure it out i think this is going to be the most trouble we ever see macy in, and we're never going to see her in trouble it's really just going to be her against herself and it's just going to be that much growth of ring iq the same way you give a kid a video game controller or a different language and a kid gets that much better that's what we're going to see for macy barber here and the adversity is just going to make her that much better she's going to be one of the biggest stars in the ufc like in that top 10 eventually maybe in my top 10 now i love macy barber i'm trying not to be on the hype train and get overhyped on her because I want to stick with what I know and be calm. She's 20. But I think she's going to lay out tons of points. I think she's going to get some takedowns. I think she's going to finish the fight. Those are all things I want to see on my DraftKings. It's all things I want to see in parlays. But don't get crazy. Don't get crazy. You got her step fitty, back. Fitty, fitty, yeah. fitty, fitty. Fitty, <laughs> fitty. But J.J. Aldridge isn't a walkthrough. So she, if she's a huge, huge underdog, she might be the worth being your um, pick just to get everybody else of strength on your card. I just don't see her being like that. She's going to get finished in round one like all of other Macy Barber fights. I totally agree. Macy Barber being a huge favorite on the betting lines, minus 235, the 8,900 on DraftKings against Aldridge's 7,300 plus 185 underdog. We both have actually TKO round number three. So is that one of those lappy rules? I think we both see a little bit of adversity, right? Agreed. a little bit of cardio problems maybe, and a little bit of frustration, but then a champion's a champion, and we see Macy getting through. it together. Um, but hey, be aware of everyone when you're watching this and your bowels get really tight because you can't believe you put Macy on 70% of your cards, even though we said stay 50-50. Stay 50-50, even if that means maybe put Altrich on 50 Not because I think she'll win, but she's cheap, and I think uh... she will get 44 points. I don't, I don't like Aldridge at all in there. I agree with you. <laughs> but I just like to stick with what I know. Macy's yeah. so new. It's yeah. like nerve-wracking. Well, Aldridge is not... I mean, she's fairly new as well. They both are fairly young. But Aldridge does is by far the probably the best fighter that Macy has seen. And she's been in the USC there. for like a grip. Like yeah, a little bit more time. Four time. fights, four fights. Yeah, that's a lot of fights. That's yeah, and the USC and the UFC. Three, win, three fight win streak is nothing to scoff at. That's Mighty Mouse. Daniel Taylor she's is like no Mighty Mouse. Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Taylor. Yeah, Daniel Taylor. She's been a in against a lot of big 115ers. Definitely. Or 125ers. So... Again, probably 80, 70% of your cards don't just go overboard with any one person on DraftKings. But at 145 pounds, we're moving on to Luis Pena versus Steven Peterson. Both of these fighters have fought in the UFC. Steven Peterson being 17 and 7. He's coming off of a win against Matt Bissett, split decision. But he's had his first debut loss against Brandon Davis decision a year ago. And Davis also in that teetering, these guys are kind of... Every other fight they could be uh, 
potentially having their contract renewed or them moving on to somewhere else. Peterson, though, has high output, is definitely somebody you like to watch fight in there because he throws out something like 15 strikes a minute, if I remember correctly. Whoa. It's crazy. He does have a high pace, moves forward incredibly well. Hick Diaz in there, Hick Diaz ish in there, coming out of Fortis MMA. The 28 year old has a ton of volume, but his defense isn't that good, even though he's throwing 15 strikes, he's only landing about nine of those eight of those and then he's eating about six of those strikes so his differential is only about two with him having way more of uh of pressure in their game and this is all at numbers mma definitely listen to that podcast if you want sp super specifics but it's one of those things that Peterson's one of these guys that just puts out a ton of volume that was a but shout out to lot. at numbers at MMA. numbers mma oh, oh. Definitely a fun podcast out there. But here against Luis Pena, we have a tactician. We have an AKA fighter. I know it says he's fighting out of some other St. Charles gym, but he's been an AKA forever. He came up out of the tough house. He is Muay Thai guy. Has some finishes in Muay Thai in there. On the ground, can scramble all right. Okay triangles and submissions, but it was against lower level competition. And I remember here still picking him against Trezino, but saying we couldn't back him that much because Trezino's a really hard fight with a good wrestler. And... Peterson on his takedowns is good, but eventually once he gets tired, they get really, really bad. And on the ground, I think Pena is just slick enough where it's going to be dicey. But I do think that eventually what ends up happening is the damage does add up and it shows more on Peterson than anyone. And Pena is actually a really good strike tactician. And the reason Trezino was such a hard fight was his, he was a good striker and wrestling where I see Peterson being more just a good striker, but he's so reckless with his high volume that I feel like once Pena gets this into a clinch, I think them knees, you know how them knees, them long old skinny legs, six two knees get up to your face. And I got Violent Bob Ross actually finishing this in round number two. I think Peterson is going to want to keep going, but that nose is going to be so sideways that the ref's going to call it. Give me Pena for the finish. Decided favorite. Who do you have in this fight? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm going with the underdog here, but I actually have Peterson by decision. I'm kind of anti-violent Bob Ross. I think he's been overrated from the beginning and people just like his name, so everybody keeps jumping on this hype train. I also don't like that violent Bob's trying to step down 10 more motherfucking pounds. I think that's going to be a hard 10 pounds, which makes him even more prone to a knockout, and it's not that I think he's going to get knocked out. I just think he gets hurt enough to mess up his cardio, and then he's not going to throw as many punches. Peterson is reckless in there, and I think his kookiness and craziness and a boring fight can make that much of a little bit of spark so people remember the round i think he's going to eke out the decision as we're getting deeper into this fight card i'm starting to think the same thing that you're we we thought last week was going to be more exciting we got a lot of decisions and then this week i just have all decisions so i'm yeah. hoping it's a little more exciting but i see myself falling back a little and i don't know if it's because i lost on DraftKings <laughs> for the first time in a while um but i see myself pulling back a little from going too heavy on this fight card i'm just not really excited it's a weird fight card. i agree it's definitely one of those that yeah make your money make your plays but don't spend the bank thinking that there's great great reads because ugh, it, it's definitely there's there's unique fights in here i have to also say for peterson's sake that Brandon Davis that beat him came out and looked like a whole different man. That Brandon Davis that beat him came out and looked like a Brandon Davis that I'm like, whoa, this guy's taking it like looked like I would bet on him or like he looked like he advanced from the walkthrough. I used to think he was a tomato can. And then I'm like, oh, this guy's legit. He's really putting his skills together nicely. So I'm giving Peterson a little bit of the credit. I think this the line's way off here. And I think um, Violent Bob Ross has painted himself into a corner in the UFC. Peterson decision. <laughs> wow. 9,200 on DraftKings for Pena against Peterson, 7,000. I'm going to say stay away from Peterson everywhere. And I'm actually going to say Pena, especially after showing he had, he has to really uh, he show up here. So 20% on my DraftKings. I don't think How I go heavy at it? all. 9,200 for Pena against 7,000 for Peterson. 
Are you going to play Pete Rizzo? The only thing I will give Pena credit is his game is a lot like Brandon Davis. A lot, a very similar game plan where he's ground heavy and um, okay striker. Is that right? Kind of? No, I think think you're more right where they're both strikers, Brandon Davis and Pena, where I don't think Pena or Davis are necessarily that. Oh, I just picture it being kind of like wrestler guys with like striking being secondary. Um, but I don't know. And you know what? Another thing. Well, then my downfall for Pena is whatever Italy, whatever Italy. <laughs> I don't really care. We ain't got no Italian fans. I hope <laughs> your violent Bob Ross sucks it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't really care. Peterson decision. <laughs> Inter- How much on DraftKings are you going to play Peterson, if at all? Probably on like 20 to 30 percent of my cards. And I won't put violent Bob Ross in it. Maybe I, on one. I'm saying Bob Ross on like 20 to 30% as well. I just, yeah. Burn me once, can't burn me twice. <laughs> so, to 125 pounds, we have a lot of these middling lightweights profiled this entire fight card. Is that some of the hesitation as well? They tend to be a lot of really much closer bouts than in the heavier weights. A lot of the heavier weight guys were like, knock out rap what? <laughs> yeah, it. it, it. Another weird thing is, like, you never know what few fights where one guy is going to lay out 160 points just from punching for three rounds. And you're like, whoa, didn't see that coming. Where anyone who had that one guy that went to decision on their card is the guy that wins the fight. I don't know. Totally. It's a weird fight night. It is an interesting one. And 125 pounds, we have a fun, super fun fight in Juicy A Formiga versus Division Figueredo. Figueredo coming in with a perfect 10-0 record, having four fights in the UFC, winning most of those by TKO, knockout, getting a split decision in there against Jared Brooks. A lot of people said Brooks won that fight, but then coming off of two knockouts against John Moraga and also beating Joseph Marias. I mean, Figueredo in there is power in a bottle. This guy... Has not the best cardio, but, I mean, he loads up on his shots, and he throws them from all sorts of crazy angles. There's finishes where he came in on a guy, threw an uppercut from his hip, and then when the uppercut missed, he turned it into a stepping back hammer fist, knocked the dude down, and finished him with strikes. Like, that's crazy levels of power to be landing. It's just, you see it on a lot of his fights. What I love about Figueredo in his fights is not his cardio or his necessarily his fight IQ at times, even though he is a, a really crafty, serviceable striker. He lands with power, and he knows he lands with power, and he his game plan is to get you out of there with power. He throws his super sneaky George Foreman. Is he the old, bald 60-year-old now? Right? With the grill? With the grill, yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, this is 100% right. Watch old George Foreman tape and look at him talk about this sneaky stepping uppercut. Figueredo throws this. I haven't seen anyone break break this down. And I don't edit videos that well. If I can, I'll figure it out and do it because it's George Foreman talks about it. He'll set and instead of resetting in his stance to go, all right, now we both get back into this brawl. He steps in and on his step, he loads his power shot and throws a stepping uppercut. Figueredo throws it in every one of his fights, and he's knocked out two dudes with it heavy, and he lands it with power. So something you got to watch out for, especially when guys are ducking in, trying to get a takedown, because everyone wants to try to take down Figueredo, and he has serviceable takedown defense by him just hitting you on the way in and then having a solid sprawl. Against Juicy A Formiga, he's definitely going to have that sprawl test to the max because Juicy A for a Novo Niao Brazilian guy actually has great double leg takedowns and uses them very often. With a 22 and five record, the Brazilians use his wrestling more so than most and used it really well on the ground. Once Formiga takes you down, he is a leech. He sticks on you, rolls through really well. A lot of guys have tried a lot of rolls, a lot of just general light scramble guy stuff. And Formiga's one of these guys who seat belts you dives with you and rolls and all of a sudden has your back your neck and is all sorts of dangerous in there but for Miga standing wise he's serviceable has an okay chin it's probably one of his biggest issues is that he will get a bit more rocked and a lot of people see that Divisio with his power only has to land once and I totally agree with that Figueroa only has to land one time to get him out of here but there is 
has the victory against Figueroa. And it is in that wrestling. It is beating him on the shot before he lands that strike and then onto the ground. It's not letting it um up at all. And Figueroa on the ground is also serviceable. So this is an incredibly close fight. This is a profile fight. This is a must watch UFC fight. I am finally got an underdog in one. Give me Formiga. I feel like he ends up wearing out Figueroa in the first round and then ends up winning a decision, if not potentially finishing in a submission. Round number three, give me the underdog. I needed one. Woo. It's Woo. a scary one. It's one. You're going you're gonna to be sweating. You're going to be sweating because that knockout punch is always a step away, especially with that slick-ass uppercut that he throws. Who do you have and why? Figueroa is crazy in there, and he is fast in there, and I don't think Formiga is a glass-jawed anything. I like both guys, and it's weird that they're fighting each other right now. It's like, they're not two of my favorites, but they're two guys I really enjoy, and usually right when I look at a fight, it's kind of easy to make an emotional decision on who I want to win, but here, I don't really have that. Um... And you can't even go with like, oh, well, it's new guard versus the old guard. No, they're about the same guard. Um, the only thing that's really different is the UFC. I feel like Formiga is the guy with more UFC years that we know of. Yes. And But it's not because uh, Figaro, Figueroa is... Figueredo. Figueredo is any less veteran he's just been in it seems like a different organization maybe somewhere um i don't know that much pa past the point of what i've seen with both guys in the ufc and i just think division i just see him picking apart the body I see him winning the first round because I can see him staying away from getting taken down. He has okay takedown defense. Mm -hmm. But I see what you're saying, that eventually that veteranship and those years of being able to get, you're eventually going to get a more tired guy down and you're going to do it again in round two. And I think uh, Figueroa is going to have to stay alive a little bit on the ground in round two and it's going to be one and one going into the third. And I think all those body shots are going to slowly add up. I don't... I have a finish round three, but I could go with the decision, and I think it could be a close decision. I agree. This is the fight of the night. I have Figueroa KO round three. Woo! Split up here at Lab B. Split skis but I up. Think it's it could, such a yeah, fun fight, though. This is but a good one. On DraftKings, you're going to end up paying 8500 for the minus 180 favorite, Divisian Figueroa, against... Juicy A for Amiga, 7,700 plus 145. You know who I'm going to be playing? Uh, both of these guys. I feel like both are a good option here. 7-7. Seven, seven, um, potentially, Figueredo might be the better play here because... Well, I think they both have both high ceilings because I do see Formiga potentially submitting in the third round and I see uh, Figueredo potentially finishing by knockout in any one of the rounds. So I, I think 50-50. I think you put either guy on either card. In my opinion, if... Now I can't even remember both their names. They blend together. No, Formiga, <laughs> if Formiga wins, uh, it's only by decision. I don't see him submitting, but I do... He could eke it out, but I don't see a lot of points there on his side. I it, I do see Devisian getting a lot more points if it's a finish for him or if it goes his way, even with fight that they're kinda, fighting styles. I agree. I do think that the ceiling is higher potentially. Ooh, oh, for beer getting time. there, getting there, uh, for Figueredo potentially. But like I'm saying, I think 50%, that beer's for Memphis. <laughs> This one goes out to Memphis. <laughs> the 10 Aussie. The 10 Aussie. Not endorsed by either one of those companies, but we waiting. We waiting. It's the only football I pay attention to. <laughs> <laughs> with these guys, anything left with this profile fight? Because I exposure either way. I think you got to play this one up. Oh, you know what? FYI, for our audio listeners, um, he really just got a beer. <laughs> We didn't talk about didn't what happened during that oh, exchange. Oh, yeah, I was stealing. <laughs> that was, like, for YouTube, and that's not fair. Because our YouTube <laughs> audience is, like, a fragment of our real Sorry, audience. that was very heathenistic of me to not describe. Yeah, look how excited we were. <laughs> like, beer! <laughs> I think I might have even said beer 30. Maybe I believe the that, that was commentated Sorry. in there somewhat. So, fun one we're going to have there. We should have said, but more importantly, he's opening a beer. <laughs> <laughs> 
On to 155ers, we have John Modeski. Real quick. Yes. This is a small guy fight card. Yeah, right? In Miami, we're getting a big guy fight card. If you have your brothers, wouldn't you like a medium guy fight card? Aren't you at like a 155, 170 or? I like the mixed salad. I want it all. Give me a, a little, little bit, bit of ladies, a little light, middle, and heavy. Toss it all up. Yeah. You like a toss salad? I do like a toss salad. <laughs> that sounds very, very McNally of you. <laughs> He's all about them toss salads. Little shout out there. So so is um, Tom Segura. He just wants a little chum scrum. He just wants <laughs> that's all he wants. He doesn't want to give it, right? No, he just wants... Yeah, He, just he wants, wants to receive it. it. Yeah, and Christina's like, no, thank you very much. Who wants that? I agree. Well... I guess, I don't know. Teach their own. Why don't you just ask me to lick the litter box? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this is a horrible video. No, we're breaking off to the side. But there was just some lady licking a toilet seat that was going around Twitter. (gasps) Did you see that? No way. Oh, my. It was an airport toilet seat. Yeah, in a plane. And she's like, I like to be nasty. Uh, block and report to the FBI. I'm just saying. That's a hate crime. That's a fucking hate crime. That is insane. Do it. That is, I would put that little weird gif of that um, little child with the weird teeth that's like. <laughs> I like the little boy who's standing there and looks around and is just like, uh, with a cup, his red cup, just like, what what's going on? <laughs> like, what are we doing here, people? So, what we are going to do here at 155 pounds is, welcome back, John Modeski against Jesus Pinedo. Pinedo being 16 and 4, definitely the newcomer only beating Devin Powell in a decision four months ago. The Peruvian fighter is 22 years old against longtime veteran 16 and 6 off a two-fight winning streak, Modeski. The bull himself is a taekwondo stylist who I officially don't give enough credit to. He's in those top six top five type guys as far as uh landed strike percentages in there is Modeski as and as well as defense he's very hard to hit in there but my criticism criticism of Modeski from that is when he does get hit it all goes south very quick so I guess instead of me saying he was brittle I want to say maybe he's more of a front runner but even then I've seen him have uh spirited valiant efforts in winning and losing competition so I don't know how I feel about Modeski but respect all to him he is an accurate striker in there doesn't have tons of power but is known to come up on the better side of decisions in striking battles against Pinedo the youth in here in the Peruvian fighter his striking ability is much more limited even on the ground he is much more limited. He likes to get the fights to the ground and dominate a much lower level competition. Devin Powell, though, striking isn't, I would say, as good as Modeski as well. I think that would turn into a split decision. And I think that these guys, it's more interesting to me that Modeski's fought higher level competition and is stepping down to a guy that only beat Powell. I feel like there should be gaps because Modeski's fought Venata, even though he lost in there. But he beat Trujillo decision and Pearson, which I would say are leaps and bounds better put on paper than Pinedo. But what Modeski used in there as well was great takedown defense. It's hard to get Modeski down and striking wise he's been shown to be more than serviceable. I don't think Pinedo's able to land his wild shots that he tends to get off in there. And then I don't think he's able to land his double leg or sloppy double legs or telegraphed double legs if Trujillo, who's an actual uh, college wrestler and Ross Pierre Sin, who's more of a striker. But either way, those guys can't land on you. I don't think that Pinedo's going to be able to. Give me the heavy favorite. I got Modeski decision. I don't think this is a high scorer. Who do you have in this fight and why? I'm aggravated that Cheeto Vera versus Frankie Sainz isn't on this spot. This They should be swapping spots on the card. And I like Modeski all right, but and no offense to this other cat, but what the... What the... I don't even understand why this fight's made. Modeski's a big enough name to be fighting other big enough names like Ross Pearson's. You know, like Ross Pearson, is he going to be a champion anytime soon? No. But is he a big enough name that if he's on a fight card, you're like, oh, at least I saw Ross Pearson on my fight card. At least I saw John Modeski. No offense to Jesus Panudo, and maybe they're trying to build a name off him. But if you're going to take a 155 or John Modeski's a big enough guy that you can send... 
Unless they are like, let's build a Peruvian guy up. This guy's a slayer, and this is all. I just think this is a really odd setup fight for Agreed. like what we've seen WME do. So, and am I too hardcore for thinking John Modesky's a bigger name? Am I too hardcore? I no, feel- I don't know. Trujillo Pearson. Pearson yeah, could be a Hall I- of Famer. I'm just kind of confused. So I have my dusky decision because I'm hopefully seeing, like, maybe missing something that the UFC is doing here. But I respect, um, I'm going to stick with what I know and respect the veteran, respect Tri Star Gym, and respect the only guy that if there should be somebody that's third on a main event of a fight card, no offense to Jesus Panudo. And we've seen really weird stuff happen with UFC in the last year. But I just feel like this is a weird fight for me, and I thought John Medeski deserved a little more climb. Definitely agreed with that. The heavy minus. And I know I hated John Medeski in the past. Yes. Because he had a brutal knockout, and we were all like, John Medeski's done. Yes. But he's back. No. <laughs> <laughs> the heavy minus 270 favorite. Medeski's going to end up being 9,100 on DraftKings against the. Underdog oh, at plus two. He might be my linchpin of the night, and that's Modesky? A crazy. That's thing. crazy. That's I don't think there's talk. a high score. That's crazy, Doc. What's his normal points? Sixty-one average points for Modesky. Oh. Against Pinedo's eighty-five with a seven thousand one hundred price tag on DraftKings. Oh. Maybe you're right. He's not. I don't think this. I think there's a pass for me as far as DraftKings wise. I don't think it. Maybe if there's a play, it's Pinedo because if Modeski's nose breaks like that again, or his jaw breaks like it has before, he he just breaks weirdly when he breaks. I'd something I've never liked. That's like him. the Patrick. That Patrick, and then he wins. Alan Patrick. Yeah. It's like that same. I because they have this brutal injury like that. It's so hard to overcome it. Right for me to to get it out of my mind, and let alone him who has to keep get in get in there and fight again. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to forget, let alone him. <laughs> right. So I don't think I'm going to expose myself at nine thousand one hundred. Pinedo is definitely the one there to be playing. I don't if you're know. Gonna be playing one. I don't think I'm going to be playing Pinedo. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. On the co-main event, we're going to have the heaviest boys of the night at 265 pounds. We have Curtis Blades coming in against Justin Willis. The Evolution Fight Team, TJ Dillashaw, touched fighter, is going to be Blades coming on a two- or 10 and 2 record, only losing to Francis Ngannou both times. First time by injury, second time in China by a 30 second knockout. Ended up getting beaten into oblivion there. Against the 8 and 1, Willis. Willis is coming off of a 7 5 winning streak. I believe he's only lost his debut. The 31 year old fighter is fighting out of a, the AKA Daniel Cormier series. He's fought multiple times in the UFC now, has been on the better side beating Chase Sherman. And also Mark Hunt in there three months ago, beating Alan Crowder, James Moharan. I mean, these are fairly low-level guys, but he did get wins in there and used it by actually for a heavyweight. Uh, at what is it? Five foot ten, six three. My ass, six three. My ass. Justin Willis is six three. Yeah, he's that, a smaller guy. No way, he's six foot. I would say six foot's pushing it for Justin Willis, but six three, there's no way at all. But he likes to use his uh, kickboxing, okay, like kick, jab, moves away, and actually has a really outside light guy style. He fights like a light fighter. He, he's very belly heavy. Doesn't look like a bit of athlete, but has been proven to go three rounds heavy and be able to just use his takedown defense to keep you at a distance and land those little rabid shots. Anybody at this weight class has knockout power, and we've seen Curtis Blades' chin hold up a lot better than this against Nagano, who's probably the top level of power striker. I don't think Blades has to worry about it in Willis. Willis doesn't tend to uh, finish fights. He's more of that decision fighter, beat you with cardio, and Blades has great cardio. It's all whether Curtis Blades can use that wrestling to get you down in there and be able to finish you on the ground, or even get it there because Willis has really serviceable takedown defense. Again, the level of competition has been different, but I do think that eventually Blades can use that D1 wrestling because if there is a tall guy, Blades is going to look like a monster at 6'4 because he's every bit of that 6'4. He's a lot longer and definitely uh, 
has more avenues. I think Willis is just a, a striker with takedown defense where Blades can strike as well. Throws up. Uh, I just think on the ground he can eventually get it there. This is still an iffy fight. I do think that it goes to decision though. For these heavyweights, a lot of people see a finish happening. I don't. I think both of these guys stay at distance and Blades gets maybe one or two takedowns in the entire fight. Ends up winning it. I think this is actually going to be a fairly low scorer. Give me the favorite. I think it's too high of a favorite. I think it's much closer. Minus 300 is just ridiculous, especially coming off of the loss he came off to. I got Blades in this decision, but the line's off. The price is off. There's no money to be had here. If anything, you got to take a shot on Willis. Dog or pass. Who do you have? I agree with you on that all day, especially because guess who got knocked out three months ago? That is in the red flag zone for Lesbo and the Bean. If three months is the no go time, and that's the only reason I'm going with Justin Willis here. That and hmm, what could train you for a fight with a really good wrestler? Too bad you can't get in some practice with the best wrestler at heavyweight that there ever was. Too bad you can't get in some practice with Daniel Cormier. Oh, wait. You are, in fact, Daniel Cormier's training partner. So what style are you prepared for more than Curtis Blades? True. His chin is not ready in three months. He was brutally knocked out. This isn't Curtis Blades here. Wrestling for wrestling skill, I think they negate each other. Strikes-wise, I think they might negate each other. But the fact that Blades does have those inside elbows and those kicks... I do put him a little ahead. If this wasn't on the three-month mark, I would have blades all day here. I just can't do it after three months. So when I'm on the fence, that three-month mark pushes me to Willis. I got Willis for a sneaky underdog decision. I Depending on the price, I think you are so correct. It's dog or uh, all day. Just dog. Pass, but minus 300 is wrong. Wrong, wrong. On DraftKings, 9000 even for Curtis Blades against Willis is 7200 If you need a cheap guy, I totally agree. In a decision, Willis pays that off all the way, especially with high output. Willis, for a sloppy guy that he kind of looks for that body type, he has high, high output at the heavyweight division. So this is definitely... I sure wish I could wrestle a really good guy like Cain Velasquez so I could get ready for against a guy like Curtis Blades. Oh, wait, I do. In fact, every day, wrestle Cain Velasquez. I'm just yeah, saying. 100%. That's my... And Daniel Cormier. And DC in a gym that we known are prone to take punches and, and all Luke the Rockwell time. And <laughs> yeah, I like I like him. And plus, he's it, to me he's getting in that comfortable zone where it's like he's going for his PhD now in the UFC. He's made it through the four year. He's got the bachelor down. He's good under the lights. It's he doesn't have a knock a brutal knockout coming in and everything to prove. He has none of the pressure on his side. I think if you are on the fence with this fight. And you're so dead on. The odds are off. The odds are off it here. Should, I think Willis should be an underdog here. He should be a little yes. sneaky underdog, but it should be a little sneaky. Yeah, like minus 160 blades, like plus 140. Not this crazy money. So value-wise, Willis is more than a live dog here. More than more than a live dog. Definitely dog or pass situation. Anything left with those guys? Day to day. How do you feel about uh, the Mortal Kombat walkout? Because it's one of my favorites in the UFC Who for Blades. Who walks out to Mortal Blades? Oh, Always. That's good. Right? That's what I think of when I think of... Razor Blades? Mixed martial arts to me. Mortal Kombat. I totally yeah, agree. it's like how he says I it grew too. up. Like, Mortal Kombat. And he says it gets him high. Sonya. Sub-Zero. Johnny Cage. Stephen Thompson. Anthony Pettis. For the main event, at 170 pounds, we have a profile main event to... Uh, well, a title contender and a former champion down all the way at 145 and 50 pounds. Moving all the way up. The Duke Rufus Disciple is 21 and 8. Anthony Pettis, Showtime himself, has definitely had a speckled career in there. Being the first man on the weeding box. One of the most endorsed uh, fighters of all time. Having a supposed fallout and mental game issue. And also being brittle and coming back from adversity and... Last losing, a fight of the year candidate against Tony Ferguson, corner stoppage. 
dude a broken hand five months ago. It wasn't only a broken hand. He broke his entire face. There was some amazing photos where Tony Ferguson was off of his back cutting Anthony Pettis apart and Anthony Pettis licking the blood out of the air. We all thought Tony was injured. He was so bloody. Yeah, it was unbelievable. But all true, all testament to Anthony Pettis, he did hurt Tony Ferguson in there. He landed some great body shots, uppercuts, great jabs in there. I mean, he broke his hand for a reason. He landed that on Tony Ferguson and rocked him at times in there. But we know what we got with the crazy man in there <laughs> too soon. <laughs> and Tony I know, it's so weird. That's his moniker. We can't even be like, oh, the crazy man. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> with love, with love. But uh, five months ago from a brutal fight like that, is Anthony Pettis all the way healed up? I was listening to Duke Rufus, his coach, talking uh, recently saying that at 170, Pettis has never looked better because he's able to actually um, do everything he wants to, not worried about cutting weight, focused only on getting better. And they think it's going to really specifically style matchup be advantageous because, and this was a really interesting breakdown because they're saying that Anthony Pettis is more versatile on his feet, switches better, where Anthony Thompson is a... Steven Thompson. Steven, sorry about that. Steven Thompson is a Kyokushin karate master at 14 and 3, only losing to the best in there. Steven Thompson uses that in and out movement better than anyone, uses that Horiguchi Gunner Nelson style, throws a ton of kicks. His knees are fairly shot in there as well, but he doesn't shoot takedowns. On the ground, he is really good, but he doesn't really go there because he has issues with his knees where he even talks about where it's hard for him to stay in figure fours and do all that kind of stuff. So he just does what he likes. And striking wise, Duke Rufus is right. Anthony Pettis has, I know it's the showtime kick, but not only that, he switches his stance as well and attacks that leg really well. And I think that that's been a big attribute and uh, takeaway that not a lot of people have attacked well against Thompson is that leg. He has knee issues and a lot of kickers have really given issue to Thompson. We don't have to worry about Thompson getting Pettis to the ground where Pettis is nasty on the ground, but they know what they're training for here and it's a striking battle. So it's Taekwondo versus Karate and it's a hell of a matchup. The size advantage definitely goes to Thompson, but he's not a guy who's really cuts too much to get there. He's not the biggest guy in there. So this is much watch UFC. This is profile. This is going to be some of that spinning shit. You're going to see axe kicks, heel kicks, uh, calf kicks. I think the better boxer is actually Anthony Pettis a little bit more, but he is the guy who breaks his hands more and his shoulders come out of place a little bit more. So this is... I don't see the favorite being this big of a favorite in Thompson. I do have Thompson winning a decision, but I feel like... It's a dog or pass situation here. As far as drafting wise, I don't also see the value in a decision for Thompson. It is going to be a five rounder. I just think that Pettis is a live dog here. I can't side with him, but the minus 425, that's also just too much. Too, too much. How long has it been since uh, Wonder Boys had a finish? Mm, it's going to be a few years now. Maybe. Hendricks off of off of USADA. Johnny Hendricks. Off of USADA like four or five years ago. And post surgeries um, for Thompson. Then before that, Jake Ellenberger. No longer in the UFC for reasons. And way before that, back in 2014, Robert Whitaker. Which at 170, a different Whitaker Whitaker, moved up. Yeah, a different Whitaker, a different. I love that Anthony Pettis is going up to 170. I love this. I just wish it wasn't against Wonder Boy. Obviously, in my opinion, I, I agree with you that Anthony and his team must have seen something exploitable in the fight against Till because of all that, like you're saying, Muay Thai karate, all this kind of style. And we kind of just saw this with Till Wonder Boy. Um, a lot of people do think Wonder Boy won that fight. Um, most people, uh, like hardcore <laughs> fans, most people. So, But I do think their style matchup, like you're saying, uh, the team of Anthony Pettis saw something in that fight that they felt that's exploitable all day. We can do that. 
I just think Stephen Thompson's been a dude that he only loses to 185ers. He has yet really to lose to a 170-er. <laughs> He's lost to uh, Woodley twice, this monster who was on his path training every day, not the Hollywood, Holly Woodley. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, and then the Darren Till. So he's only lost to Woodley, in my opinion. I do like Anthony Pettis coming up this weight. I'm super interested in to see what he can do. He obviously feels like this will put him in contention and put him on a hot track. I just feel like, dude, you're still, not that he's young, but he still has enough time to get comfortable in this division without having to feed himself to the wolves right away. But maybe he sees a path to victory. He's also a very veteran guy that I, I want to give him some kind of respect. So I'm giving him to round four. But then I just think the other guy is just going to be a little too much power and he's going to get caught one time. I just don't think Pettis has the opportunity. If Thompson didn't get finished by Jorge by Tyron Woodley both fights and getting taking Tyron Woodley's best hits different than everybody else taking his best hits and still surviving I just can't see Anthony Pettis knocking him out um you've made me more excited for the fight than I was oh it. interesting it's stylistically it's a crafty matchup it's it's got fireworks for me written all over it which Anthony Thompson's kind of been one of those guys that... Wait, Anthony Pettis or Pettis. Stephen Thompson? No, Anthony... Stephen Thompson. <laughs> Don't you feel like they're both kind of on the same trajectory right yes. now? They both need this fight in a weird way. They totally. both need a headline. But it's they so both weird need... how Pettis is just moving up so dramatically where he initially thought 45 was going to be his new home. That's the only thing. If he, he should have... It's almost like it was a fear in him instead of moving up then. So he moved down. So now he's like, maybe I can move up if I'm match selective. But I do think they're both big enough names, and it's kind of the same. John Modeski's not to these guys' level, but he could be doing this kind of shit. So, oof. You don't think it's a finish? You think it goes to decision? I think it goes to decision. Do you think it's a close decision? Uh, I think it could be three or four rounds to Thompson. But I do think that Pettis can win one, two, if not three rounds in there. So I think on the ground, Anthony handles Steven. I just don't think it goes to the ground. I don't think it goes to the ground either. But so. if it does, that's in my that's the other thing too. If I'm Anthony Pettis, I convince this guy it's going to be a stand up match, and I forget go heel him. hook city. Yeah, because he has a great Bad ground knees. game. So uh, yeah, yeah, like you're saying, set it up with some weird little leg kicks and like do that stuff. The same thing. That's that what Tilden. I'm thinking. Oblique kicks. Yeah, that's so. exactly what I'm thinking as well. People saw stuff in those that fight to be able to take away. From I got it. Thompson finish. I think this is a weird matchup, and the, the same way as I can't go heavy on this fight, it's the same way I'm going to stay away from this whole fight card. This I week. totally agree there's other spots there's other profile matchups on the weeks not what don't do not not watch of course your hard course you so listen you to Liz Pettis could be worth some points 100 for a five rounder 100 especially at 6,900 on DraftKings. the huge underdog is a live dog he's a live dog to me 9,300 for steven thompson that's way too much uh he has to get a finish to cover that especially earlier in the rounds unless it's like a high active which both of these guys are in the same range as far as numbers wise. Like they don't really outstrike each other too too much. If not, Thompson is more of a counter striker and can lull back into a low output more so out of the two. So body shots, Pettis has really fun shots. So I think I'm gonna play out of the two. Anthony Pettis more. Wow, but I might take that advice and speckle him. At least I I I thirty percent. Thirty percent. I'm gonna put them some places. Some places. Do I don't say no. Do you think you put both guys on any cards? Like stack them? Yeah. I think there's a there's a potentially a shot for that. Play? It could be, but nine three is hard to stack anybody at nine three. But I mean six nine, it does counter that up. Yeah, it's, it's the exact counter. <laughs> it's the exact counter. <laughs> But don't stack them on a parlay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what we'll leave you with. I love you guys so much. You're the best fans in the world. That's what me. Thanks for listening to Let Be. For all things Lesbo and the Bean, head over to lesboandthebean.com or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.